very much, Minori, and uh, hello, everyone. I guess I have to click got it. There we go. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming everybody is in here. Somehow I managed to miss out on the whole like training of how to use Zoom um, by living in a forest monastery. So we'll just assume that it's okay to go ahead. And uh, I believe that we're starting off with a little bit of meditation. So uh, if everybody would like to get themselves comfortable. Close your eyes and just bring your attention inwards. Setting the intention that for the next half hour or so, this is the time for meditation. Putting aside anything from the past which might be lingering. Just intentionally letting that go and feeling what that feels like in the body. And also setting aside anything in the future, plans, fears, hopes, and just coming into the present moment. Checking in with how you're feeling right now. Restless, peaceful, agitated, excited, sleepy. It's all okay. Setting the body in a posture that is relaxed, yet gives respect to the fact that we are practicing meditation. Checking in with the feet, making sure that they're comfortable, noticing any sensations. making any adjustments that are needed. Moving the attention up to the ankles. Bringing a sense of kindness and caring and softening. Allowing the calves to relax. Mm -hmm. 
lengthen and soften. Creating space around the knees, noticing any sensations. If there's any tightness, just asking the body what it needs. Developing that right attitude. Relaxing and sinking into the thighs. Just feeling that solidity and connection with the seat. Resting on the sitting bones. And allowing all the muscles around the hips and lower spine just to soften. making any adjustments so that you can sit comfortably and peacefully. And gently moving the attention up the spine, allowing and inviting each vertebrae just to sit in a comfortable position on top of the one below it. Relaxing any muscles that are tight in the abdomen or lower back, allowing the ribs just to float over the hips, naturally supported. Just starting to notice the pleasure of a peaceful, relaxed body. Opening up the rib cage. Releasing any tension in the diaphragm and the ribs. Maybe naturally you'll just take a few deeper breaths. Whatever feels comfortable for you.
Just allowing any muscles around the shoulder blades and arms to soften. Stretching the neck and back if it needs it. Just those places where tension might build up from time to time. And just checking that the arms are hanging in a comfortable position. Asking your hands if they're okay where they are. Just adjusting them if it needs it. Feeling the delight. The relaxed body. Allowing the shoulders just to float over the ribs and over the hips. Without any effort or strain. Moving the attention up the back of the neck and into the base of the skull. Releasing any tension, creating space and kindness. Relaxing the area around the eyebrows, releasing any worry and thinking. Softening the jaw. The mouth. And the throat. Helping to release that inner chatter. Just sinking deeper into that feeling of peace. Noticing the qualities that you need right now. Peace is both bright and uplifting, as well as grounding and settling. Just feeling the joy of the relaxed body. And as you do so, the breath might naturally appear.
welcome it. Now we'll sit together in silence for about the next 10 or so minutes.
And as we come close to the end of the meditation, take a moment to reflect. What was the process of the meditation? What were the stages? What led to greater peace? What allowed you to stay in the present moment? And how do you feel now? compared to the beginning of the meditation. Also bringing to mind that no matter how the meditation proceeded, just the intention to sit down and cultivate peace is a beautiful adornment for the mind. I'll now ring the bell three times. When you hear the last ring of the bell, I invite you to come out of meditation. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, I hope everyone is feeling a bit more refreshed and relaxed. I see a few few smiles. I'm not very good at driving this whole Zoom machine, but I see a few smiles. <laughs> um, so I guess it's time to get on with the Dharma talk. So I just want to express my gratitude first to Venerable Chanda for uh, inviting me to come along. Um, Venerable Chanda is someone I have a great deal of respect and, and love for and really think that the Anikampa Bakuni Project is such a fantastic thing um, and really admire everyone who's been supporting her as well because without you all, then... Uh, it wouldn't be able to happen. So uh, rejoicing in all the goodness that uh, everyone who's who's contributed to Anna Kumper in big and small ways um, has contributed. So uh, here I am at Santee Forest Monastery, um, a few hours south of Sydney, and we're on uh, Gundagara country. Uh, so it's traditional... Uh, land of the Gundagara people and here in Australia we acknowledge that the land that we are on is never ceded and uh, so it's it's customary to acknowledge the traditional custodians. So for today's talk we're going to be talking about sealer. Sealer is a superpower. Now I was wondering how many people I'd be able to scare off with the uh, topic of sealer because well, you know, it's not the most fashionable thing to be talking about sealer, right? Um, I'm trying to click around and see more people's faces, but I'm not so good at this. We'll just leave it like that. <laughs> 
stick with a few beautiful faces instead. Um, so, yes, sealer as a superpower. Now, it's definitely not very fashionable for us to think of, of, of sealer, I think, in this modern day. It's kind of like virtue's gone out of fashion. But actually, for me, it was one of the things that really got me interested in Buddhism. And you you kind of be wondering why, because often when people talk about virtue and even about Buddhist virtue, then they'll say, oh, you know, our five precepts, they're pretty much the same as in any religion. And in one sense, they are, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a code of ethics. But the thing that really struck me and one of the aspects, I think, that makes it a superpower is that we're undertaking it as a training and as a choice for ourselves. So that means, you know, that's a big difference, I think, from, say, like a religion that's a theistic religion where we might be undertaking because we're just told to. The whole point of, you know, a lot of what the Buddha teaches is about learning to make better choices and this is what karma is about so sometimes we'll think of karma in terms of you know there's that kind of popular idea of karma at least where it's like a fatalistic thing but really karma is so much well but the buddha says that karma is about our choices and so when we chant the precepts and we say that we undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings, then we're saying that this is an important value for us, that this is something that we're lifting up um, because it's important to us. And the thing with values is that they direct the whole course of our lives. And so when we undertake training to not kill we're not doing it out of fear of punishment we're doing it out of a love for a better existence and that's one of the things i think that really makes buddhist ethics stand out in a different way than from other religions and even secular ethics to, a, to an extent because our choices affect our mind states and seeing as this is the foundation of the path then having beautiful mind states is going to allow us to progress further along the path so it's it's kind of then then it's not so daggy right it's like you know you see those people with their bucket list instead of a bucket list We've got precepts, we've got sila, we've got virtue. We're guiding ourselves in a wholesome direction that then will lead us to more wholesome results. So instead of it being about creating fear, it's about creating positive change. And one of the things I like to come back to in the Buddhist teaching again and again is to look at the gradual training. Now, I don't know how many people know about the structure of the gradual training, but there's two different paths that the Lord Buddha gives us. One is the Eightfold Path, and you'll also see in the suttas the gradual training. And so that's called the Anupabhasikka in Pali. And I think it's just this fantastic kind of roadmap to see where you're at within your Dharma practice because it's such a well thought out um, well, roadmap of psychological development, I guess, because you you have you the Buddha says that you acquire faith, and in in Buddhism, of course, faith isn't like a faith that just blindly believes. It's like this confidence that what the Buddha teaches might be worthwhile. And I think more people who even, than even call themselves Buddhists would think that. You can judge that just from the number of Buddha statues in people's front yards, right? They see something in the Buddha that is of value. 
Um, obviously here we see more than just the peaceful smile. Otherwise we wouldn't be spending our Sunday listening to some Dhamma. But it's that first one undertakes some confidence in the Lord Buddha and then from there they pick up the training. And so in the gradual training it mainly talks about uh, someone who goes forth as a monastic. But you can also see this um, as undertaking the five precepts or the eight precepts if, say, you were taking a retreat or wanted to take the eight precepts for a certain amount of time. And from there, one develops confidence within themselves. Uh, there's The Buddha will talk about hiri and otapa. And sometimes we'll hear that as uh, conscience and concern or moral shame and moral fear. But I like to think about it, and I've heard other teachers even talk about it in more positive psychological terms, which is self-respect and respect for others. And so this is kind of where the sila aspect of the gradual training really comes together. Because by keeping precepts, we're bringing ourselves up as more valuable. We're bringing value into our lives. We're orienting our lives around uh, wholesome, wholesome values. And we're also saying that we're not going to cause harm to other people. You know, we're not going to physically harm other people we're not going to lie or deceive other people so that brings a sense of trustworthiness to us and people then have respect for us and also there's a sense of you know, reliability then uh kame sumi chachara which i think of i think the buddha was so progressive with this and i think like you know, there are, with with this because it's it's about consent. It's about respecting other people and their their boundaries with their bodies. It's about not taking advantage of people who don't have the ability to consent. It's about having res respectful relationships with your partners and having that communication. And I know that ISOMA is going to be talking more about this in a few weeks' time, so I won't talk any further about this, but a, a little sneak preview for ISOMA's talk because I'm really looking forward to hearing it myself. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, I, did I, I missed a dinner dana, not taking other people's possessions. So I've got the precepts out of order, please excuse me. Um, but again, it's that sense of trustworthiness, right? You know, we had a we had a retreat here the other day. I think it was yesterday, and we had uh, a group of twenty to twenty five year old, you know, university students and people kind of just starting out in the world. And they spent the day here at the monastery. And at one point during the day, we left the meditation hall and we walked down into the forest to visit one of our caves. And uh, when I came back, I was one of the first people to walk back into the hall. And sitting right here, lying around, was everyone's handbags and wallets just sitting on the floor in the middle of the Dharma Hall. And I mean, like, if they'd gone out to the nightclub, I don't think they would have left their wallets and, and um, handbags just sitting around on the floor. So, you know, again, it's that sense of trust that they had for the people that they were here with. I think that's so beautiful. And then the last precept, of course, being uh, about not taking intoxicants which dull the mind and lead to heedlessness. And as well as, you know, just making you a more pleasant person to be around. And valuing relationships, right? Because when you're dulling yourself down or someone else has kind of dulled their character down and, and manipulated it with alcohol or other intoxicants, then you think that maybe you're kind of like doing that social lubricant kind of thing, but really it's not such an authentic interaction. 
And I think this is really kind of another interesting angle to look at with, um, you know, with with telling the truth as well. We we think that we're telling the truth to bring people together. You know that I mean we're not generally telling the truth. Just you know, most of the the kind of tr half we tell half truths or white lies more than those kind of really manipulative truths. If we're going to tell a lie, and we think that maybe you know this might be might bring people together but if someone finds out then it's actually done more damage to the relationship so it's it's not strengthening relationships but it's well it's strengthening relationships by keeping the precepts so by holding oneself to a higher standard we're going to find out that we make mistakes sometimes but that's a kind of a beautiful thing because we can learn from that. And as Buddhists here, we're trying to abandon greed, hatred, and delusion. So, you know, this is one of the things I've really benefited from with the Bakuni training because every fortnight we come together on the full moon and the new moon and we will sit together with another monastic or this might happen throughout the fortnight as well if we've committed an offence and we will sit with another monastic and say, I've committed this offence. I've made this mistake. And all of a sudden you can't hide from that. Like the it, it peels away this kind of mask of delusion. And so it's like this extra, extra thing that you don't really consider that the precepts does. So the precepts are, are, are a safety fence for us. They create that trust for us. But if we undertake them kind of at a greater level, then they can show us a lot more about ourselves than we, we might expect. So in uh, Majjhima Nikaya 61, which is the Ambalatika Ovada Sutta, it was a sutta that the Buddha gave to his son Rahula. Um, the Buddha asks uh, Rahula, what do you think? What's the purpose of a mirror? And Rahula obviously answers, it's for checking one's reflection. Uh, and so the Buddha says, in the same way, deeds by body, speech and mind should be done after repeatedly checking. So, you know, this is an aspect because we can often be on autopilot with our sealer. We think, oh, yeah, you know, I've kind of been doing this, this five precept thing for a while. And you can kind of be like, yeah, no worries. But to use a very Australian phrase, <laughs> you know, it, it's a beautiful thing to actually notice when you're, doing the opposite of the precepts. I had a, I had a friend who'd come, just come to the monastery. She's uh, Anna Garica over at Damasar. And one day I saw her with this beautiful smile on her face and a leaf, and she was carrying, I don't know, a millipede or an ant away from where we put our shoes outside the dining room. And she was a stressed out little Anna Garica. <laughs> you know, they're very busy. They've got a lot of work to do at the monastery. And she came back over and I said, you better remember that. And she looked very worried. And then she realized what she'd just done. And this big smile came back across her face. And it was beautiful. And I think, you know, so often we don't take the time to recollect those, the benefit of, of our sila, the benefit of our good deeds, the times when we've kind of spoken really nicely. Or well, someone has, has done that for us as well. Another story along that lines I remember um, hearing from one of the, the senior bhikkhunis I lived with at Dhammasara, and she actually became a Buddhist for the same reason. She was out having, I don't know, lunch with some, some people that she'd met while she was traveling somewhere, and this guy saw, I don't know, an ant or a beetle or something walking across the table. And, again, he, he just so gently, you know, spoke to the ant and picked it up and just moved it off into the garden. And she'd never seen anything like that before. 
she'd never seen anyone just take the time to do that for such a small little creature. And she was so inspired that she asked him more about the Dharma, more about kind of why he was doing that. And he was a Buddhist. And, uh, you know, I think these things we take for granted sometimes if we've been practicing for a long time. And it's nice to reflect on them. So going back to the uh, Amba Latika Vada Sutta, uh, I thought I'd read a little bit more from it. So the Buddha says that we should be reviewing our acts of body, speech, and mind before, during, and afterwards. And asking, is this act harming myself, harming others, or harming both? Is it skillful with happiness as an outcome and a result? So we ask this before we perform an act by body, speech, or mind. And of course, if we get yes, then the Buddha says, you should live with joy and rapture because of this, training night and day in skillful qualities. And that's beautiful, right? We see this in other suttas as well, in the Asutta to Mahanama, which is in the Anguttara Nikaya, where it's one of the recollections we do, the Sila Nusati. And I can't remember it entirely off the top of my head, and I haven't written it in my notes. But basically, the recollection is that my conduct is pure, unblemished, unblotched, unstained that which is undertaken and praised by the noble ones. So we know that a uh, stream enter or above has very good or perfect sealer. So we're lifting ourselves up to that standard and that's definitely something worth re rejoicing on. So it's a beautiful thing to rejoice in our sealer. But we also have this sealer as an opportunity for reflection. So you might have heard the term Pachawakana. And in the meditation that we did, we did a little bit of Pachawakana at the end. I asked you to look back and see how the meditation worked. You know, what aspects were involved and how it affected your mind. So the Buddha asks that we do this as well. So if when we're thinking or just before we do an act of body or speech, we realize that this isn't beneficial, this is harmful to myself or others or to both, then to the best of our abilities, we should not do that deed. That's what the Buddha advises to Rahula. Then while we're doing this, again, we can ask ourselves, is this act harmful to myself, harmful for others? Is it skillful? Does it lead to happiness as an outcome and a result? And if it's yes, then of course we're going to be filled with joy. But if not, then the Buddha says, then Rahula, you should, you should, you should desist from this deed at once. Obvious, right? But having done an act which is unskillful by body or speech, the Buddha says, then Rahula, or any of us, you should confess, reveal, and clarify such a deed to the teacher or a sensible spiritual companion. Having revealed it, you should restrain yourself in the future. So I think this is a really nice thing even for lay people to do. If you have a good spiritual friend and someone that you're practicing with, then it's it's just hugely beneficial to have these conversations because talking about virtue can be a bit daggy, right? A lot of people don't want to do it. So, I mean, if you've got a good spiritual friend, and I think there's a lot of great people, you know, hanging around in this this little Zoom. Um, and I know um, Ajahn Nisipo's group, they do this. They have... Uh, they have their Kalyana meters get together and they'll, they have their little kind of sealer buddies and they'll talk about sealer and maybe a, a, an aspect of sealer that they're trying to perfect and where they might have fallen down. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to do. And I know like when I was um, keeping the five precepts and really wanted to undertake them more seriously, 
I just picked up one. It wasn't that I wasn't keeping all five, but let's say I, I wanted to look more about um, the precept about not taking what was not given. And so I, I would undertake, uh, I would kind of look at that in all sorts of different ways. So maybe I was thinking that it was okay to be a little bit late to meet a friend. And, well, I mean, you're, you're spinning all sorts of problems then with your precepts because you send a text message saying, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Mm, maybe. <laughs> right? And, I mean, it's not a harmful thing to say, but you're both taking that person's time and, well, you know, maybe you're going to be 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> and we didn't used to do that, I don't think, so much when we didn't have mobile phones to send our messages. We're like, you, you tried your best to keep an appointment. Um, or like pinching a, pinching a chip off of someone's plate, right? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty harmful and it's playful. But you, it gives you the opportunity to reflect on your mind and kind of like, why do I need just that? I had a whole plate of chips. Why do I need that extra chip? <laughs> I mean, you know, your friend who you're with, they're probably not going to care whether you take one of their chips, right? It's kind of a, I mean, they might, but it, it you know, it's a mirror for your mind. So it can be a lot of fun to kind of, well, maybe I'm a nerd, but it can be a lot of fun to, to kind of look at these things in, in different ways. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I thought I'd bring this sutra up, um, bits of this sutra up to, to share with you just because I think the bit about reflecting is this harming myself, is this harming others or is this harming both we hear a lot but we don't necessarily hear about these other aspects of reflection so much so at the end of the sutta um oh and the, the buddha also talks about what we do if we have these harmful harmful aspects by just by mind right so then it's not necessarily something we've done out in the world but the buddha says then rahula you should be horrified, repelled, and disgusted by that. Just by that that deed of mind and being repelled, you restrain yourself in the future. So I don't know if um, don't know if you know earlier on in the Majin Nikaya, I think it's in Majin Nikaya nineteen or eighteen, where the Buddha talks about a carcass of the dead dog hanging around the neck, and then you look in the mirror and you're about to go out to the party. And instead of seeing your beautiful jewellery, you see this carcass of the dead dog hanging around the neck. And, of course, you're repelled, horrified, and disgusted. So this is what a dirty mind is. So this is why the Buddha says um, that we reflect. So at the end of the sutra it says, all the ascetics and Brahmins of the past, future and present, who purify their physical, verbal, and mental actions, do so after repeatedly checking. So Rahula, you should train yourself like this. I will purify my physical, verbal, and mental actions after repeatedly checking. So this can be really useful because we're starting to get in touch then with how we're relating to our five sense world, which is actually the next thing in the gradual training. And without having this respect for ourselves and respect for others, then instead of acting in a way which is to develop skillful qualities, we can actually be developing unskillful qualities because we can be doing kind of like suppression instead when we're doing our sense restraint. But if we know that this is for our own benefit, then doing sense restraint is quite easy because we want to have a beautiful mind. We want to, it, it's not then a problem to not get involved in these things or because we know the beauty of a mind by using that reflection, using the mind as a mirror, we can then see how this works. And of course, with a more beautiful mind, then it's much easier to sit down and practice meditation. So there was actually one more little thing I've written in my notes and it just says, 
the da- it says dad dharma. So this isn't Buddha dharma. This is dharma from my dad. He came to visit the other day, well, uh, around Easter time. And I overheard him talking to someone in the monastery. And I thought it was, it was quite wise. You know, my dad's not a Buddhist. Well, he says he's not a Buddhist, but he, he likes to come to the monastery and sit in quiet places. So we'll, 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 we'll let him have, have his ways. But uh, he, he said, um, so, someone said to him, well, I made, I made this mistake. And, you know, it's the best way is to learn from your own mistakes. And he said, no, actually, that's not the best way to learn from you, um, to learn is to learn from your mistakes. That's the fourth best way. And I thought this was really interesting. And so I was sitting in the office kind of half listening. And um, so dad said, the best way to learn is to learn from your successes. So this is, again, going back to this reviewing learning from our successes. The second best way my dad suggested was to learn from other people's successes. And so that's why we have our spiritual companions here. And we have the suttas to learn from. We have the Buddha to learn from. So then the third best way to learn is to learn from other people's mistakes. You see something you think, that's a bit ugly. Maybe, maybe, maybe I won't do that. And then the fourth best way is to learn from our own mistakes. So I thought that was, that was I, I hadn't really thought of it about, like that. So that was quite nice. So skimming through my notes, just checking I haven't missed anything important, but I think, I think that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. But I thought if, if anyone wants to discuss particular aspects of the precepts, then um, we can then open it up in the chat because I'm, I think there are different things that come up for different people. So, um, and hopefully I've been able to highlight then that this is about making choices and that choices are like the key part of our Dharma practice. So if we think of even dependent origination. It's like avija pachaya sankara, sankara pachaya vinyana, vinyana pachaya nama rupa, right? So sankara is part of that choices. If you look at Bhante Sajato's translation of what sankara is in the five canas, he even translates it as, as choices. It's that intention. It's that thing that moves us forward into the world that we create. So I guess what I'm, I'm suggesting to you today is that not just through the five precepts in terms of sila, but through the habits that we choose to create, then we're creating a world that's a better place for both us and for the people that we live with. Okay. So, uh, I think Derek's going to open up to questions. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, that's right. If anybody would like to ask questions, then please put up your virtual hand. Or if you wouldn't like to speak on the recording, you can write in the chat box and I'll read it out anonymously. And while we're waiting for other questions, maybe I can start. Yes, please. <laughs> and I would like to, when you spoke about your dad's advice, I had goosebumps. And I would <laughs> like to know what your thoughts are about why the Buddha often talked about the precepts in terms of what we shouldn't do i know in the suttas there's also the aspect of what we should do with relation to each of the precepts but when they're most commonly thought of they're thought about in terms of things not to do and i think it's a great idea to think about the precepts in terms of building a beautiful mind as you said in the talk today so any more comments you have about why they're often thought of in negative terms would be very appreciated. Well, I undertake the training to not harm anyone is kind of beautiful though, right? <laughs> like if we think of it as I won't, I will not do this, then it's a negative thing. But if we say that we're going to undertake the training, we're going to lift ourselves up to this standard, then it's a totally different way of doing it. Um, and of course, there is then that other aspect which is spoken about in in the suttas, which is about 
you know, when you undertake the training to not harm anyone, you're also bringing up that aspect of loving kindness of metta, which is beautiful. Or if we're undertaking the training to refrain from not taking what's given, we're also then practicing to cultivate generosity. And again, this is another beautiful quality which we're uplifting in our hearts. Or if we're undertaking the training to not engage in sexual misconduct, and then we're a trustworthy person who's easy to be around. We know, I know that, you know, people have these instinctive radars about the people they want to be around and in certain places. And I think this is something that women and queer people will especially have. They have that radar of when they can kind of let their guard down. And um, so it's, you know, and those kind of people who have beautiful conduct around sexuality and how, how they how they view other people's bodies and things like that, they're beautiful to be around and and you can feel safe. Um, again, again, with speech and again with intoxicants, you know, if someone's intoxicated, you you don't quite know what they're going to do, even if they've just had a few drinks. There's just that extra level of unpredictability and stuff. So, and the other aspect, I guess, of the intoxicants is, and this is the this was actually the reason I gave up alcohol. I'd, I'd been practicing meditation for a little while and listening to the Dharma for a few years. And I'd actually lost my job a few weeks beforehand. I thought, great, I get to have a meditation retreat. <laughs> So I was spending, I thought I'd take a week just to practice some meditation. And it was, it was kind of spring or early summertime, nice time to be just spending the day sitting and walking. And then I think it was like a Friday night and I went out with a friend and I think we were going to go see a movie or some music or something. And we just stopped for a glass of wine, um, sitting out in the street, al fresco, And even just taking, like, I think I took my second sip of this glass of wine and then I could already feel like the beauty just that I'd built up from that week of meditation just kind of slipping away. And from then on, I just went, I'm not finishing this. And I think that was probably the last whole glass of wine I drank. You know, 10, 12 years later, I, I, I became, a, became a nun, but it was it was it just became clear to me that that it was the opposite of what i'd been spending so much time doing and i mean peace is so hard to come by <laughs> so yeah hopefully that answers a little bit of your question anyway derek yeah thank you very much would anybody else like to ask a question Benjamin. Hello. <clears throat> so um, I related a lot to what you said in the beginning about um, finding that the the aspect of sila was very attractive about Buddhism. And for me, especially the concept of non-harming, I think was the major thing that turned me on to Buddhism, along with the meditation practice. Because I've always been very... Uh, just naturally inclined to that uh, so I became a vegetarian when I was six because I realized that meat came from animals and I thought no um, so the the precept of non-harming I would say is kind of my personal base for morality um, and I'm living at the moment in a scenario where I'm with people who like to squash bugs and uh, kind of uh, all, that, all that kind of thing. They're particularly not fond of spiders, flies, moths. Mm. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to, how to prevent that from leading to resentment, because I do find it quite, uh, quite hard to look kindly upon people when they do that. Mm. No, that's, that, that is difficult. And I think this is the thing with our with our training as well is that we're undertaking it for ourselves and if we start to start to develop resentment around other people's sila or try and force it on 
on other people, it can become quite difficult, right, as you're saying. Um, and we have to both be looking after our own minds and after other people's, um, after our own minds. And also, you know, by building up that resentment, say, with your housemates and stuff, you're more likely to kind of lose it a little bit and then that non-harming is still not there, right? So I don't know whether there's a way of using more skillful speech even just to communicate how you're feeling if you see it you know not to say not to do it but like you know when I see you squash that bug then I feel I feel really really kind of distressed or I feel you know really concerned because to me everyone every every being's life is important and then you're not judging that other person when you're communicating it. You're not building up that resentment. But you, yeah, you're also also able then to just kind of not bottle it up. I don't know if that that work that would work in your situation, but I think, you know, I think also just re rejoicing in all the bugs that you do get to save. Get to the bugs first. <laughs> <laughs> You can get home five minutes early, run around with your little leaf or your little takeaway container and just scoop the guys up. And, Come on, buddy. We... I'm on moth patrol every morning. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Casey. Hi, so first, thank you, Venerable, for, for your talk. Um, it is, I, I think, as many people here um, have also been quite drawn to Sila, and so I always enjoy a talk on Sila. Um, so before my question, just a quick comment on uh, what Benjamin said, because I also have um, had a, you know, had, I think as many of us do, as we develop more and more virtue, then smaller and smaller acts of unvirtue start becoming like more and more, they feel more and more gross, more and more grievous and um, shocking when seeing other people do them. And just a quick comment on something that's helped me is to reflect back on dependent origination and realize that they're just reacting to their own, their own condos, their own causal factors, and that it's not usually an intentional act of hatred. It's more in a lack of mindfulness in a way and something that in the end isn't you know, might be causing more harm to them, just kind of feeling that like, yeah, this is just the nature of samsara <laughs> and it's not those individual people's faults. They're just conditioned that way. And to feel fortunate that we're conditioned in a way that um, usually tends towards more kinder acts of saving insects. Um, and just to feel fortunate for, it's for beautiful. that is something that's helped me. <laughs> um, and you yeah, know, maybe, so, maybe they'll make them inspired one day as well, right? <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so my question, um, Venerable, is about uh, because I have recently joined a, a Dhamma discussion group. Um, I I live in Laos, so uh, here here in Laos, and um, a lot of people here, people who are. Dhamma, like followers of the Dhamma here, um, often very much are focused on this goal of becoming Sotapanna. Um, and so recently I've, I've noticed um, just something I've observed in this group is people um, have, because of reading the suttas, have realized that, oh, sila is the, the base of this. Um, and then they work very, very hard on the sila and kind of use it as almost like a checklist of like, okay, where, where am I on each of the five? Like, how much farther do I have to go? And then if I get it perfect, then can I become Sotaban or something like that? Um, and so I think something that I'm just curious about of is, um, so if, if as we, we know, like sila is, like kind of the root and the starting point. Um, but of course, also it seems like, of course it can't go alone and the three factors have to have to go together. So kind of like, at what point can we get an internal sense of when maybe we need to start looking at other aspects of the practice? Of course, we're always developing all of them. So I know it's kind of a, um, 
maybe difficult to answer question or not. Um, yeah, but just kind of to, I've just been thinking about this, about sila, of course, is the root, but then how do we know when is a good time to redirect our, our focus towards other aspects or when it's helpful to bring those in? Or, um, of course, I, you know, even if I bring it up at the, I probably wouldn't, you know, try to tell other people, no, you can't just do sila. But um, if I wanted to say something to kind of encourage, like, oh, well, maybe there's there's other parts of the path to practice too in a way that would be productive. Um, but it's not just me like thinking, oh, you don't just do sila. <laughs> so just wondering your thoughts and suggestions on um, on this kind of thinking of at what point we need yeah. to focus on sila as our superpower and what point we need to bring in some of our other superpowers thank you <laughs> well i think i think it's a superpower because it's a, it builds such a strong foundation and um one of the, one of the things is that you know before we develop non-self we have to develop a healthy sense of self um and somewhere in there you know, we can fall into this spiritual materialism, whether it's chasing jhanas or ticking off your little five precept boxes like you were talking about as well. So, you know, but I think um, done done correctly, and this is what I was trying to you know, emphasize in terms of the, the power of sila is that it can it can be something that develops that that confidence within ourselves because the Dharma practice is very different from other other religions in the sense that it is something that we have to develop for ourselves. It's not, uh, it's, it's a try before you die religion or a, or a DIY religion. Um, so, you know, this, this is, this is the difference, I guess, is that it's not going to be something that, you know, when you die, someone's going to be telling up whether you're a sotapanna or not, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tool to develop those wholesome qualities in, in the mind. Um, so how then to encourage people to take up other aspects? Well, I don't know whether you, I think, I guess the easiest way, if you're in a, in a, in a traditional Buddhist country and you're discussing the Dharma would be to bring up some of these gradual training suttas and see how that they progress because they're beautiful in the way that they do progress where sila leads to sense restraint and sense restraint then leads to not eating too much and not sleeping too much. And when you, you're delighting in wakefulness, then you're not nodding when you're when you're um, trying to get some meditation in, and you're not distracted because your head is full of like the latest pop songs and what's going on on social media. Um, so you know, this is what I was kind of alluding to when I said that it's such a beautiful kind of psychological model that the Buddha has put together, which is kind of sometimes missed uh, in in the suttas. So um, there's a sutta called the Ganakala Mogalana Sutta which might be a nice one to read through if you do sutta discussions um, where, the, where an accountant named Ganaka, uh, sorry, an accountant named Moggallana, Ganaka means accountant, comes to the Buddha and says, well, you know, as an accountant, um, we, we have a mode of training and as an a, a, you know, apprentice carpenter, you have a mode of training and is there a mode of training which, which the Buddha prescribes that would um, then lead to stream entry and arahantship and stuff like that. And the Buddha says, yes, there is. And then we'll outline this mode of training. Um, but I think there's a, there's, a, there's a nice little line in there. And maybe it doesn't answer your question, but it, it's something that stands out to me. And uh, the Buddha then asks um, Moggallana, the accountant. Oh, no, Moggallana, the accountant, asks the Buddha. So if... If someone was to know about this and they were to hear these instructions, would they become an arahant? And the Buddha says, well, let me ask you a question in return. And it says, well, do you know the way to Rajagaha? Uh, and and Magalana goes, yeah, sure, I know the way to Rajagaha. And so, and if you, if you were to describe the steps to go to Rajagaha, then would someone necessarily get there? And he goes, well, 
no, they could take a wrong turn. They could think that they know better, blah, blah, blah. They think they have a shortcut. And the Buddha says, well, this is the same with my training. So I think it's a, it's a nice thing to kind of to reflect on. So people, maybe they know about these different aspects, but maybe they also think they've got the shortcut to Rajagaha. Right? <laughs> so, but it, it's a great sutta and it's one of the more. So if you haven't looked at that, that's uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya around 107, 107, I think. Yes. <laughs> great. Well, if we don't have any more questions, then I think I meant to throw to to Shell. So thank you, everybody, for having me. And it's been wonderful to meet all the Anacumpas. And, uh, yeah, thank you for supporting Venerable Chanda and uh, having, having me on here. And uh, I'll be back sometime in October. <laughs> Thank so, yes, you. I think we'll um, I'm just going to pop a note in the chat. So, thank you so much, Venerable, for such a beautiful and serene meditation to start our mornings and your wisdom as well on Sila. It's so inspiring to hear from you and from other bhikkhunis, and we're so fortunate to be offered the teachings of early Buddhism. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We're very grateful that Venerable has come this morning. Uh, this evening for her and given her time to help us with our two aims to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism leading to full awakening and help to establish the first forest monastery in England where women can take full bikini ordination. Thank you so much Venerable for supporting Anukampa. We're full of Karuna and Mudita and Metta for Venerable Chanda who's currently on her one month uh, retreat in the US before she enters Vasa uh, in Perth. And we continue to support the amazing project as she that she commits her life to while she is on retreat and nourishing herself and the community as a whole. All these teachings are offered in the spirit of dana, generosity. If you are able, we are asking for your dana, generosity towards Anukampa. We've seen the project flourish this year and we wish to continue to support the Bikuni Sangha in the UK and start raising funds to expand from our beautiful Vihara in Oxford to an even bigger abode to house even more bhikkhunis, aspirants and lay supporters. Without the support of the community here this morning and wider community, we wouldn't be where we are today, spreading the teachings of the Buddha to all. If you can, we are asking for monetary donations to support the expansion of Anukampa. However small or big you are able to give, every penny is so gratefully received to support the Bhikkhuni Sangha and get even closer to having a full forest monastery for Bhikkhunis in the UK. Please visit the website to donate and the link is in the chat. You can offer a one-off donation or more regular monthly donations that will really support the project. There will be opportunities to offer food dana for the Vihara from December onwards and offer your time at the Vihara from the new year. Should you wish to offer these, please email team at anukampaproject.org. Please also see the Anukampa website for the weekly teachings and uh, meditations that are being offered by the wonderful Bhikkhunis and Ajahn Brahmali, as well as the wonderful Anukampa uh, volunteers who are running the other sessions while Venerable Chanda is on retreat. Uh, there's also uh, links to Ajahn Brahm's teachings and tour in November on the website, as well as the upcoming on her return, which will be in the UK, the US and Norway so far. Please note that next Sunday will be at 7.30 p.m. British summer time with Ayasoma on Buddhist and other sects on Tudong, just it, reflecting on her recent experiences on Thank you all so much for coming this morning and thank you so much, Venerable Prasanna, for your time and your wisdom. No problem. Sadi, sadi, sadi. <laughs> so in true Ali Kampa style to sign off, uh, we will unmute everyone if you wish to say goodbye and we will <laughs> see you at some point in the week.